So I just uh, tried to open the, 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 the share point here. There we go. Let's see if this works now. Ok, creo que vamos a empezar con el Luis entonces, Oscar. Gracias Muchas por gracias. estar listo. Uh, you don't have my PowerPoint showing, do you, or do you? Uh, if you want me to, I can share and you can tell me when to move the slides on because I have it. Oh, I hate to do it that way, but I, okay, go ahead because I can't seem to get it sharing right now. It's here. I'm going to, okay, I'm going to do it. Yep. All right. All right. If I could have somebody very kind in the room, tell me if they can see this in a second. Here it comes. Yes. Go yes. Thank you. Yeah. And can you see it moving on? Uh, not yet. Uh, yes, yes, we can. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay. okay. Over to you, too. Eloise. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I, I will just start right off in, into the paper since we're a little late. The history of the Cuban Revolution of 1959 is still being discovered and written. As more people and their actions become known, we move closer to understanding all successful revolutions. And now flip. Uh, next slide, please. I just a quick definition of dual power, which is probably not necessary for most here, but I just want to be sure. It simply means two states within a national territory. Each functions as a state, each governs, and there's a conflict that has to be resolved. And in the Cuban Revolution, that dual power occurred in late 57 through 1958, basically. Next slide. The, um, the first view that I'm presenting here, because the title of the talk is Three Views on Dual Power in Cuba in 1957 and 58, and that would be the view of the 26th of July movement. And most of what I'm presenting here <clears throat> is basically the view of the 26th of July movement. And I, my first presentation here is about Che Guevara's uh, encounter with Antonio Yibre, uh, whom he was looking for to be an auditor in his column. The conversation has been shortened a lot, but Che says, you're half a lawyer, right? And Tony says, I finished two years of law school, but I'm not a lawyer. And Che says, you're a leader, a Marxist, and I need you in the, as an auditor of the column. Tony says, what's that? And Che says, you're going to be like the political commissar of the Spanish Civil War. Next one, please. So as my long interview with Yibre uh, develops, he explains what they did. What did an auditor do? What did the 26th of July revolutionary movement do? And he talks about the first uh, aspect of setting up a whole new justice system and an organization for living in the Sierra Maestra. This is setting up the, the justice system where in a system in an area where there really hadn't been much of a justice system nor any kind of government. It wasn't just political and it wasn't just judicial. It was to protect law and order or to establish law and order. And any uh, time one of the people was accused by a neighbor or someone else, and they could have been accused of anything from the low level drunkenness, uh, some kind of mis public misconduct, up to spying for the dictatorship. And each person who was accused had a defense lawyer and a trial, and a three judge panel would decide the outcome. Relations between the troops and the local people was part of this justice system. And um, 
acquiring food for all in the liberated territories, that is not just the troops, but also the population who had stayed there, was also part of this new system of organization and justice. And as keeping public order and organizing, in many cases, organizing work teams. Next slide, please. Here, I, I'm, I'm going to sort of show you on the left the problems or the, the challenges and how they were resolved by the, uh, the, the, well, maybe basically the auditors, but they were the sort of civil representatives, if you will, or civilian representatives within the rebel army. The rural population would come to the troops to resolve all sorts of disputes many of them about day-to-day -day life and the new eventually they had to set up a new agency to handle civilian social needs that's in addition to schools and uh, clinics and so on um, there was a need for land to keep what the farmers produced because i haven't yet mentioned but many of you probably know this that um, many many Cubans, after the War of Independence from Spain, didn't really have their own land. And that is, is especially true in eastern Cuba with the predominance of, of former slaves or children of former slaves. And uh, after fighting in the, in the uh, War of Independence from Spain um, and assuming that there was going to be land at the end of the war, that totally fell apart. However, the newly independent Cuba did set aside large amounts of land as state lands uh, or national lands, and many of uh, many people without land settled on those and drew their whatever they needed to survive or as much as they could, and also worked or worked as tenant farmers or sharecroppers. Um, and the way that was resolved is that land was granted with certificates signed by officials, but at this point only on the uh, state-owned lands. <clears throat> Finally, there were many special conditions. The need for labor, for example, to save a coffee crop. Many of you may have read about this in some other form, but troops basically at one point were organized to pick the coffee crop in 1958 in, in an area of the mountains and to find material to make the coffee sacks that they needed to save the harvest. Uh, next one. Political organization and people preparation. First, they, the auditors discussed the revolutionary program, what should be done, preparing people for participation teaching troops and the local population how to read and write, also building schools, clinics, and basic, doing basic health education. And finally, political legitimacy. And this involved getting the local population involved, in many cases, writing the actual news stories that would be broadcast on Radio Rebelde. Because by this point, Quite a number of local people have already been convinced and have already joined as uh, rebel soldiers. Um, you may know the statistic that about 7,000 soldiers came out of the Sierra uh, Maestra and Sierra Cristal. But remember, the original troops were less than 200. Well, the original troops were less than two dozen, but the uh, at the time they got their first shipment of arms, the July 26 forces were really less than 200 people, less than 200 fighters in early, say mid 1957. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> well, all this work did produce some revolutionary results. Of the 50,000 people, many troops were recruited. Um, and, and I have a quote by Lou Perez about 
how extensive that was and how it's proof that indeed uh, people from those uh, the rural areas did join the, the guerrilla forces. And by the fall of 1958, um, and this is a quote from Lillian Guerra, the uh, 30 of 41 sugar mills uh, were, or 36 of 41 sugar mills in Oriente were paying taxes to the rebel, uh, the rebels and not to the Batista government. So that indeed is an example of dual power. That is, a new state has been established in the area. It collects taxes. It carries out all sorts of governmental functions. And now I want to go on to the next one, please. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. And this is our second view of how they uh, won over the forces in the, the, the rural areas. And this view, um, I've, I've called it history matters race, class, communists, and peasant organizing from the 1930s, which is seen as being a major reason for the victory um, of the July 26 movement. And this is, and I say with special thanks to recent research by Lisa Brock and Sarah Kozame. Next. Looking back a ways, um, the abolition of slavery in Cuba took place in, by sort of various stages beginning in 1860 a over an extended period of time. 1879, however, slaves in eastern Cuba were not willing to wait, and they organized strikes in Santiago to demand their freedom. <coughs> by um, 1895, Hmm, says my, okay. After 1895, free men fought to um, uh, for independence from Spain. And excuse me one moment. I'm going to reduce the volume of the mic for your. Is that okay with? Is that a better sound? <coughs> the Not sound sure. is the sound is fine. Okay, I got a note that, that there was a lot of noise on the mic, and I'm not sure why. At any rate, <clears throat> um, after abolition in 1895, as we know, um, many uh, men from all over Cuba, but especially in eastern Cuba, Afro-Cubans, fought and led the battles for independence from Spain. And by 1899, and this is a long quote from Hugh Thomas, he's basically saying that more phone, uh, farms were rented than owned. And for years, titles and surveys were very difficult to come by. And white owners outnumbered black and mulatto everywhere, except in Santiago, where for every three white farm owners, there were two black or mulatto farm owners. So you can see that Eastern Cuba, bring the next slide, Eastern Cuba was quite different from the rest of the island. <coughs> On issues of race in land and organized labor, over 60% of the soldiers in the Cuban Liberation Army were black, but by 1907, and this is with U.S. Uh, dominating the island, only 13% of Cuba's army and police were black. <coughs> Lisa Brock interviewed Comandante Victor Drake, who you may know of as being one of the major uh, Cuban leaders of, of Cuba's intervention in Africa. Um, over the over the late 20th century, really. Um, when he was growing up, he knew Jesus Menendez, a leader of the sugar workers. Um, he was also black and also from Sagua Grande, like uh, Drake. And he, <coughs> which this is an area inside Las, Las Villas, which produced over 40% of the sugar for Cuba. Um, <coughs> and Menendez was a leader of the Sugar Workers Union, 
And he's well known for his uh, barging in on a meeting of negotiations in Washington, D.C. in 1945. And in 1947, that was resolved by sugar workers receiving a 40% rise in wages, an incredible change. And Menendez was assassinated the following year when Drake was 11. But Menendez has been remembered um, as a great leader and also um, the, his party, the then the PSP, which grew out of the former uh, Communist Party, is also known <coughs> and respected for that. Next slide. Eloise, you've got two minutes left. All righty. I think, I, okay, can we get zip? I think we're close to the next. I'm not going to go into the farmers fighting, but that is the essence is that in the 1920s and 30s, but especially after the 34 revolution, the Communist Party sent or, many organizers into Cuba and they organized quite a number of um, peasant associations. In the next slide. Uh, the peasant, in, uh, the Congress of Peasants in Arms, you may know of from September 1958, but that was prepared by a, a conference in July. Uh, 32 associations uh, took part in that. Um, there were six large assemblies between July and September, and uh, three of those had over a thousand uh, farmers participating. And they organized 81 more farmers committees or associations. And the, the elected delegates, 203 of them met in September. And the next slide, please. The upshot of all of that was that the, uh, there, there came more um, agrarian reform out of the July 26th uh, movement. And the summary of this view is that the rise of black communism in the 30s and their contributions um, to the influence on the uh, 26th of July represented an important pillar of support. Um, by the time Fidel Castro's, and I'm quoting here, uh, Cosme, by the time Fidel Castro's rebel troops settled in the Sierra Maestra, the region's local peasantry already had decades long links to the communist party and its political commitment to advancing land reform. <clears throat> Next, um, the only point that I want to raise here uh, then is a very short one. We're not going to spend much time on the third one because it's a, a almost a silly construction by the author herself, um, who's basically, she's written two books and uh, a recent article. Uh, basically talking about the idea of Fidel Castro as a self, uh, not self-proclaimed precisely, but somebody who saw himself as a messiah for Cuba. And there's a lot of religious uh, language in her arguments for this case, but she doesn't really make a case, nor does she say that he's a charismatic leader in the Weberian sense of the the, def, the, the, the serious definition of a charismatic leader. But her one piece of evidence is uh, to the, the image that we see on the next screen, if you would. And can you, yeah. And this is what is the constructed Messiah. And this was actually an image that appeared apparently on a television show and when people wrote into the television station asking for copies, uh, Bohemia magazine, I guess, produced uh, this uh, in a way that it could be cut out to be put on the wall. And this was her evidence for the reconstruction of Fidel as a messiah. And that she presents it as if that is the way the Cuban people looked at Fidel. And I won't get into any more of her arguments except to quote one last thing uh, to show how it is not the Cuban people, but rather the author herself who has made this construction. 
And that quote is about um, in an article from 2019 in which she describes the January 1959 trip of Fidel and the hundreds of others from Santiago to Havana following the victory uh, at the end of 58. She said, quote, Fidel and his massive convoy parted open the country like a veritable sea in biblical times, end of quote. And Fidel's reception among citizens was also highly produced, managed, and choreographed. That's the end of the quote. In other words, it's a very cynical look, I think, at the Cuban revolution. And we don't really need to take it very seriously, except that the author happens to have been able to use as a central this idea of the constructed messiah as a, an expl explanation for the victory of the Cuban revolution. She's, she's peddled it in two books and in a more recent article and among many prominent people who study Cuba. So I guess I, I thought I had to kind of mention it uh, and bring it to your attention. Okay, I think that's that pretty much does not uh, do a lot to explain uh, all the research that's gone into this larger project. This is just a little teeny slice of, uh, of the broader research project on the Cuban revolution, really going from 19, the coup in 1952 up to January 1st, 59. The other two views we could look more seriously um, my summary here, just uh, in view one, the July 26 interpretations should make a solid case for why thousands supported and joined the rebel army. They got something, they, they, they liked what they heard, they liked what they experienced, and the relationship was like a partnership, but under the leadership of the 26th. History, but history is always being written, and the story of, of rural Cuba um, it, it is also um, being written, and it didn't start in 56 or even 52. And in terms of the second view, um, the omission of the historical record of black farmers, labor disputes, and the role of the Communist Party should become, I think, more prominent in the historiography of the revolution of 1959. Even if the CP role is exaggerated by Kozame, which I think she did a little bit, uh, she did not, uh, she, she actually said that the uh, 26th of July needed the legitimacy that was conferred on them in 1957 by the uh, farmers in Oriente, basically, and, and by um, their political history. Um, Okay, that may be an exaggeration, but it is important to recognize it. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. Thank you very much, yes. Eloise. Yeah. Um, I, I do apologize for not giving you a five minute warning. Um, I was too interested in what you were saying, but I should have warned you in, in time. But you managed to squeeze more time out of me anyway. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Okay, let's move straight on so we'll leave all the questions till the end. So we now welcome in Espanol. In Espanol, Oscar Lopez Acon de la Universidad de, de Zaragoza sobre el sabotaje y la guerra económica del sistema impositivo rebelde, una nueva historia de la insurrección cubana. Bueno, tiene la palabra. Um, buenas tardes, eh, espero que me escuchen bien. Sí. Eh, eh, lo primero, mandarles eh, un un afectuoso saludo al profesor eh, Antoni Cancia, por supuesto a la, a la profesora Par por hacer, por hacer esto posible y, y también al, al resto de colegas eh, eh, oriundos de Cuba o eh, ingleses o, o de cualquier otro lugar. Bien, el estudio que presento busca explorar una nueva vía de análisis para explicar las causas que llevaron al desmoronamiento del régimen batistiano y al triunfo de la coalición de fuerzas lideradas por el movimiento 26 de julio, el 1 de enero de 1959. Para ello, pretendo proyectar la mirada sobre dos aspectos que, a mi juicio, discurren paralelos en dicho proceso histórico. 
de un lado, la estrategia político-militar de las fuerzas eh, insurgentes durante el año 1958, que fue producto directo de las experiencias acumuladas durante el año anterior, y de otro, la reacción de las élites sociales, las clases económicas, como aparecen nombrados estos sectores en las fuentes eh, cubanas, cuya retirada eh, del apoyo al régimen batistiano fue decisivo para su desmoronamiento. Bien, realizar dicha tarea en el tiempo disponible requiere soslayar muchos aspectos y reclama un enorme esfuerzo de síntesis. Algo nada sencillo, dado que el trabajo que aquí presento es producto del análisis de una serie de fuentes eh, documentales primarias, eh, tras, eh, tras el cual pues, he traído una serie de, de conclusiones. Por ello, si estuvieran eh, interesados en, en ahondar en alguno de los aspectos que a continuación voy a tratar, Quiero señalar que una versión más completa y pormenorizada de esta comunicación verá la luz el, el, en el mes de septiembre, en el número 81 de la revista del Centro Superior de Investigaciones Científicas Anuario de Estudios eh, Americanos. Y, por tanto, pues pueden en, en esta revista digital eh, entrar en discusión con cualquiera de, los, de las cuestiones eh, que plantee o poder eh, contrastar eh, los datos y las fuentes eh, bibliográficas y las fuentes primarias. Luego puedo facilitarles, si, si es de su interés por el chat, el, el enlace de, de, de este y otro trabajo. Eh, en aras ya digo de que puedan entrar en discusión con, con lo que yo voy a, voy a plantear aquí. Bien, como veremos, las dos cuestiones sobre las que quiero articular la, el debate, la discusión, están fuertemente imbricadas. Por un lado tenemos la infraestructura de la guerrilla y por otro tenemos el proceso que los eh, sociólogos históricos eh, Tilly, Tarrow y Matt Adam han eh, denominado deserción de las élites. Para el caso cubano, eh, Alfred Padula fue el primero en plantear en su tesis doctoral en 1974, The Fall of the Bourgeoisie, que la élite empresarial mantuvo una doble cara de lealtad pública hacia Batista mientras apoyaba eh, subrepticiamente a los rebeldes, con importantes contribuciones económicas. Las razones estribaban en algunos casos en la enemistad con el dictador, pues sus negocios se habían perjudicados por la desmedida corrupción, en otros lo hicieron por razones idealistas, despreciaban la brutalidad del régimen y querían eh, restaurar el orden constitucional, o también de forma pragmática, para defender sus intereses y ganarse el apoyo de las nuevas élites emergentes a finales de 1958. Por su parte, el historiador Marcus Winokur sostuvo la tesis de que a partir de 1955 un sector importante de la burguesía eh, azucarera, liderada por el magnate Julio Lobo, le quitó apoyos a Batista, el cual se había adherido al convenio de Londres de 1953, lo que suponía zafras, eh, zafras restringidas e imposibilitaba la posibilidad de, 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 de competir en los mercados internacionales por... Eh, por el, por el azúcar. Bien, el corpus de fuentes que me ha permitido validar estas hipótesis procede de distintos archivos, instituciones cubanas, como la Oficina de Asuntos Históricos del Consejo de Estado, el Instituto de Historia de Cuba, el Archivo Nacional de Cuba, además de fuentes diplomáticas eh, españolas como inglesas. Bien, el 20 de febrero de 1957, eh, Fidel Castro, que llevaba 80 días en la Sierra Maestra, hizo público un llamamiento al pueblo de Cuba, en el que exhortaba a intensificar los incendios de campos de caña para privar a la tiranía de los ingresos fundamentales provenientes del azúcar. Bien, los rebeldes cubanos de los años 50 apelaron a la TEA redentora como forma de lucha contra la dictadura, de igual modo que los mambises de la, de la centuria anterior. Pero fue en el otoño de 1957 cuando el ejército rebelde lanzó su plan de sabotaje masivo para destruir la zafa azucarera bajo la consigna Zafra sin Batista o Batista sin Zafra, como eh, primer paso para des des desvertebrar económicamente al régimen. Bien, la insurrección logró paralizar el sistema productivo de las regiones eh, orientales de la isla, como han señalado historiadores como Bani Petina o Gladys García Pérez. Sin embargo, aunque en los primeros meses de 1958 continuaban los sabotajes, la campaña en términos cuantitativos había sido un fracaso. Las fuentes diplomáticas, tanto españolas como inglesas, así lo evidencian. Y es que subrayaban que para haber afectado a la economía de Cuba habría sido necesario quemar la astronómica cantidad de un millón de toneladas de arrobas de caña. La zafra del 58 fue de 5,75 millones de toneladas de azúcar frente a las 4,8 del año anterior. 
Sin embargo, el balance de, de esta experiencia llevó a la jefatura guerrillera a replantear su estrategia insurreccional. Tan pronto como los recursos disponibles lo permitieran, los rebeldes debían bajar al llano, estrangular las comunicaciones y controlar el territorio. En marzo de 1958, como saben, el recién ascendido a comandante Raúl Castro, al mando de la columna número 6, Fran Pais, abrió un segundo frente guerrillero en el norte, nordeste de la provincia oriental, en las estribaciones de la Sierra de Cristal. A los cuatro meses de la invasión, siete grandes municipios habían quedado en manos de los rebeldes. Baracoa, Moa, Imia, San Antonio del Sur, Yatera, Sagua de Tánamo, Songo, San Luis y Mayarí. Y al final de la guerra, el área controlada por los rebeldes eh, había constituido una estructura paraestatal que se extendía hasta las puertas de Santiago de Cuba y Holguín y alcanzaba entre 12.000 y 15.000 kilómetros cuadrados. Bien, durante los meses del verano de 1958, aprovechando la paralización de los combates en el segundo frente, dado que el esfuerzo principal de la dictadura de Batista, como saben, se concentró sobre el primer frente, eh, sobre la Sierra Maestra, en la llamada ofensiva del verano, ofensiva FF, fin de Fidel, pues bien, Raúl Castro va a implementar ese proceso de reorganización de su aparato administrativo. Y el 14 de julio de 1958 eh, dictó la orden militar número 39, que establecía la obligatoriedad del pago de un impuesto efectivo o en especie del 10% sobre el valor total de la producción agrícola, forestal, ganadera y minera del territorio libre de Cuba. Bien, debido a las apremiantes necesidades y a los mayores problemas logísticos que entrañaba llegar a la, eh, a la comandancia de, de La Plata, la comandancia... Eh, del ejército rebelde situado en la Sierra Maestra, el 19 de agosto de 1958 hizo extensiva esta, eh, esta ordenanza a todos los territorios ocupados por la guerrilla y simplificó eh, este impuesto. Eh, al final, dicho, dicho impuesto sobre la explotación de la caña de azúcar ascendía a 15 centavos de peso por cada saco de 250 libras, que se cubría a razón de 5 centavos por saco a los colonos y 10 centavos por saco a los centrales. Bien, el 30 de agosto Raúl Castro dirigió varias misivas a los presidentes de los centrales azucareros situados bajo su control. En ellas explicaba que las contribuciones debían ser entregadas antes del próximo 1 de octubre, ya que se tenía orden de liquidar la Tesorería General de la Comandancia antes del día 15 de dicho mes. Bien, el 22 de septiembre, en los documentos que, que he podido consultar y que están eh, volcados en esta, en esta publicación que les he mencionado, eh, se demuestra, se plantea que la comandancia central ya había recaudado eh, 170.000 pesos a los que esperaba sumar otros 400.000 que hacían un total de 570.000 pesos. Bien, una visión pormenorizada de estos datos nos permite plantear una serie de reflexiones que contribuyen a apuntalar la tesis que formulábamos al comienzo. Al rastrear los proveedores de los centrales que accedieron a pagar a la guerrilla y trazar una prosopografía, encontramos algunos de los rostros más importantes del gran capital cubano. Tenemos, por supuesto, a Julio Lobo o la Barría, el Napoleón de los negocios, considerado la fortuna individual más importante de la Cuba de los años 50, con unos 100 millones de pesos o de dólares. Seguidamente tenemos al clan Bacardí, al que pertenecía Margarita Vos Lamarque, hermana de José María, el presidente de la célebre compañía Ron Bacardí, que según el, el estudio, eh, el importante estudio de, de Guillermo Jiménez Soler, los propietarios en Cuba y las empresas en Cuba, se situaría en el primer nivel de propietarios de Cuba. Bien, a continuación tenemos a Baldomero Casas Fernández, propietario de los centrales Borjita y Baltoni, dirigente de la Asociación Nacional de Hacendados de Cuba. Tenemos a Francisco de Pando y Armán, que había sido presidente primero de esta asociación y la había presidido durante dos ocasiones en los años 50 y poseía cuatro centrales. Tenemos al empresario Carlos Núñez Pérez, eh, presidente y único propietario del Banco Núñez, el cuarto banco comercial de Cuba con depósitos de más de 97 millones de pesos, entre muchos otros. Bien, eh, Fidel Castro dictó una orden por la cual autorizaba a Pastora Núñez González a crear una comisión con el objetivo de visitar a todos los propietarios de ingenios eh, azucareros de la provincia de Oriente para informarles del establecimiento de esta contribución. 
es muy difícil llegar a calcular de forma exhaustiva a cuánto ascendió el cómputo total de los impuestos recaudados por la guerrilla. Alfred Padula llega a afirmar, aunque sin aportar pruebas documentales que lo respalden, que la contribución de la burguesía cubana a la causa rebelde fue de entre 5 y 10 millones de pesos. Eh, considero que estas cifras podrían estar algo eh, sobredimensionadas, sin embargo, la información disponible parece apuntar la idea de que los recursos que contaban los rebeldes no fueron nada desdeñables. Y es que, tras el triunfo revolucionario, las columnas guerrilleras fueron mantenidas en Santiago de Cuba hasta que se reorganizó el ejército rebelde con el dinero que había quedado en la caja, como explica Marta Rojas en un artículo de Bohemia publicado el 19 de julio de 1959. Oscar, quedan cinco minutos. De acuerdo. Gracias. En, en los meses finales del conflicto, el Che Guevara recibió, en concepto de impuestos anticipados de, de los colonos y hacendados de las villas, un total de 700.000 eh, dólares, según eh, testimonia Antonio Núñez Jiménez. Bien, la diplomacia eh, británica se apercibió del cambio de estrategia de, de los rebeldes. Estos parecían estar empleando una, una mejor estrategia pues en lugar de realizar incursiones y secuestros bastante inútiles, eh, cito, estoy citando literalmente las fuentes del Foreign Office, eh, se concentraban en cortar las comunicaciones y, por tanto, en estrangular gradualmente la economía del país. Para octubre habían ganado el control de prácticamente todo el territorio de Oriente, excepto las ciudades principales. De igual modo, el embajador español, Juan Pablo de Logendio, eh, fue consciente de que se había producido un cambio en la táctica revolucionaria con respecto al año anterior que estaba motivado por la esperanza de que al conseguir el rápido triunfo de la revolución pudieran aprovecharse los beneficios de la zaza. Bien, si consultamos eh, las alocuciones de Radio Rebelde en los últimos meses de, de la guerra insurreccional, en diciembre de 1958, eh, podemos constatar que dichas, eh, dichos programas de radio respondían a la pregunta que afloraba en los labios de todos, no solo de los círculos eh, comerciales y financieros, si la zafra podía llevarse a cabo en medio de la guerra civil que asolaba al país. Bien, eh, Radio Rebelde respondía, eh, cito textualmente, que el 26 de julio y su avanzada de hierro el ejército rebelde se comprometían a hacer todo lo posible para que no se hundiera la industria fundamental del país. En las zonas azucareras de Oriente tenían ya 25 centrales bajo su control. Eh, los datos de Lilan Guerra, eh, anteriormente citados, eh, plantean que controlaban 36 de los 41 centrales eh, de Oriente. En Camagüey, Las Villas, decían la, los programas de, de, de Radio Rebelde, no atentarían contra la zafra mediante el procedimiento otras veces usado de la quema de caña, pues estas cañas son del pueblo liberado y por liberar, y para el mismo tienen que producir su bienestar económico pues contaban con que hacendados y colonos colaborarían con la insurrección aportando el producto del impuesto de guerra como contribución generosa a la patria y al pueblo. Pues bien, eh, para concluir, quiero lanzar dos ideas en aras de, de estimular eh, el debate. En primer lugar, queda, queda claro que la consolidación de, de los focos guerrilleros, como, como ha planteado Eloís Linger en su, en su conferencia anteriormente, supuso una situación de abierto desafío al poder, que autores como Charles Tilly han denominado eh, soberanía múltiple o poder dual. Desde mi punto de vista se confirmarían dos tesis. Por un lado, que la estatalización del poder constituye un paso necesario para que todo movimiento insurgente sea exitoso, como que la deserción de las élites de un determinado régimen político resulta una precondición no suficiente, al menos necesaria para su desmoronamiento. La burguesía azucarera cubana apostó y acabó perdiendo la partida y, paradójicamente, la tempestad que ayudó a desatar el Caribe terminó por arrollarla. El tiempo histórico se aceleró y un nuevo escenario se abrió con la entrada triunfal de los barbudos en La Habana el 8 de enero de 1959. Muchas gracias. Bueno, muchas gracias, Oscar. Muchas gracias, de verdad. Y, y con aplausos también, bien merecidos. Muchas gracias. Uh, ahora noto que eh, la tercera ponente ha llegado, eh, Margaret Brechoni. Margaret, ¿estás ahí? Ah, tu fellow Jitsa. Ok, Jitsa, all right. 
Okay. Have you got a, uh, a PowerPoint to put up? Hello, Margaret. She's not fellow Jitsa. There is a Margaret no, Brown in the she's room. There. Yeah. Margaret, are you there? Can you hear us? Yes. Oh, Hello, okay. I'm here. Good. That's great. Good to see you. Uh, do you, you have any any PowerPoint to put up or are you just talking straight to the camera? I have a PowerPoint. I'll put it up now. Fantastic. And just to answer Jackie's question, yes, we are recording. Although, Margaret, if you just give me one second, I'm going to stop and start again so it doesn't interrupt you. <laughs> 